connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. Welcome to Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Paula Robeson, your host, host for the next hour. Spark Live is where we gather each Wednesday to curate, convene, and showcase excellence and in innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community with our goal to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Since we're live, I wanted to remind you all that we don't, while we don't take questions over the line, you can type your questions into the question box at any time. I'll check for questions throughout the session, so please don't feel you need to wait until the end. Just put your uh, questions in as you think of them, and we'll get to them um, through the uh, webinar or by the end. I'd also like to let you know that about an event, Children's Healthcare Canada is hosting in partnership with Alberta Children's Hospital and Alberta Health Services. This specialized event, All In, Creating Synergy in Pediatric Complex Care in Canada, will welcome over 200 administrators, frontline clinicians, patients, and families. The focus will be to showcase and share practices that we know are working to help support children with complex healthcare needs and their families. And registration is now open. Today, we're joined by colleagues from the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement to bring you Working Together to Improve Access to Care, the Priority Health Innovation Challenge. The Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, or CFHI, is a not-for-profit organization funded by Health Canada. CFHI supports partners to accelerate the identification, spread, and scale of proven healthcare innovations, and they work shoulder to shoulder with you to improve healthcare for uh, everyone in Canada. I'm delighted today to welcome our speakers. Lindsay Yarrow is a senior improvement lead with CFHI. She has a clinical background as a social worker and her master's in science in healthcare quality. She's extensive experience providing clinical leadership in both hospital and community settings with a particular interest in increasing access to high quality healthcare services for vulnerable populations. Sabrina Khan is improvement lead with CFHI and has experience working and promoting and improving quality in the healthcare system with expertise in knowledge development, communications, mental health, and addictions in the not-for-profit sector. Sabrina is passionate about promoting public health and reducing barriers to access. And Carly Brown is Pediatric Re Re Registered Respiratory Therapist Fellow and Case Manager of the Home Ventilation Program at Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, or CHEO. She has extensive expertise in sleep and respiratory medicine and the care of medically fragile or technologically dependent children and their families. Carly leads numerous quality improvement initiatives and research studies with the goal of improving patient and caregiver experiences and safety. For those of you on Twitter, please tag us at, children, at Child Health Can and at CFHI underscore FCASS to any webinar related tweets and share away. It's my pleasure now to pass the mic to Lindsay. Wonderful, thank you Paula, and thank you all for joining us today. I wanna to start by acknowledging that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by indigenous people since the beginning. In particular, I am broadcasting today from Ottawa, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place and the opportunity to gather here today. 
As Paula wonderfully introduced me, my name is Lindsay, um, and I'm the lead for CSHI on our Priority Health Innovation Challenge. I'm also joined by Sabrina from CHS, CSHI and from Carly from CHEO, one of our teams. So we're looking forward to being here with you today and spending some time sharing about Priority Health Innovation Challenge. So if you've not yet had a chance to work with or interact with CFHI, we are a pan-Canadian organization that works to accelerate identification, spread, and scale of proven initiatives. We work across many sectors and we work across the lifespan. At CFHI, our current strategy focuses on more improvements for more people that last. As we share about our Priority Health Innovation Challenge today, this is the ultimate goal of this program. We want to support you and your teams across Canada to reach more people and to sustain that change. So just a bit about the background of our work. There are four pillars to the strategy that help us achieve that goal of more improvement for more people that last. Where there are problems that don't yet have solutions, we identify innovators, innovators and incubate innovation. So this is ultimately why we're here today. We're looking for your expertise. And although all of these goals are important, we're really gonna focus on finding and promoting innovators and innovations. By doing this, we can shape better healthcare for everyone in Canada, better patient experience, health outcomes, work life of healthcare providers, and value for money now and in the future. So in our work to find and promote innovators and innovations, we have developed a program that we call the Priority Health Innovation Challenge. We will dive into this further in the webinar, but I wanna encourage you to start thinking about the work you're doing in your organization or the work that you're planning to do. I know the next fiscal year is upon us, uh, so some of you may be deep into operational planning to think about the year ahead. So we want to think about care that is about delivering better care closer to home and community and to improve access to care. It'd be great if you could start sharing in the chat box any work that you're doing to improve access to care in your community and bring that care to the client and the family where they're looking to receive service. So feel free to share in there and we're, we're going to jump back to Paula in a bit to, to share that out. We know that great things are happening in organizations small and large, in communities urban and rural across the country, and we truly want to hear more about these. So our goals for today are to share information about the Priority Health Innovation Challenge, including what it is and how you can participate if it feels like a fit for your program. Carly is going to share with you her improvement initiative, and we'll share as well the benefits of joining the challenge. We encourage questions along the way. So again, feel free to ask questions, make comments, and generally communicate via the chat box. Uh, it's great to have your input as we continue along. And we're gonna keep bouncing back to Paula to see what's happening in the chat box and if we can answer any of those questions uh, along the way. So before we proceed, Paula, I just wanna check in with you to see if there's anything in the chat box at this point uh, that we wanna share. Nope, not yet. Okay, that's great, thanks. So I'm gonna start by giving a bit of a taste of what Priority Health is. And then as I said, I'm gonna hand it off to Carly to walk through her work. And I think just give you a bit of a sense of what is that participation, um, or sorry, what are the programs um, that are participating in the challenge? Uh, and then we're going to hand it off to Sabrina, who's going to do a deeper dive into the program. So don't worry if when I'm going through, you're still not clear on um, all the aspects of Priority Health Innovation Challenge. This really is just a taste, and then Sabrina will do the deeper dive. So the challenge is based on an open innovation model. And open innovation is a way to seek knowledge and learning, especially when it comes to complex problems. In our case, we, know, we have a known problem, and that's um, access to home and community care. And I suspect most of us, uh, sorry, in mental health and addiction services, and I suspect most of us would agree it's fairly complex. If you've tried to address this challenge, there are really multiple factors that impact access to care. So we're asking you to share your solutions. We're asking you, what are you doing in your organization to improve access? And by sharing those solutions, you have access to financial awards, 
networking webinars where we hear from experts in the field and a chance to highlight your work nationally. We provide webinars every two to three months to support your team with improvement and also your participation in the challenge. It's an opportunity for organizations across Canada to share the work they're doing to improve access in these sectors. And what we ask is you register with CFHI uh, and you share the scope of that work and project. So again, Sabrina will walk us through all those metrics, but it is a fairly state pro straightforward <laughs> process and it goes to the statement earlier. We want to bring more improvement to more people that last. And we know there's a wealth of knowledge in the room today. So by sharing your program initiatives, as well as your results, we hopefully are able to identify those programs that have potential for further spread and scale across the country. So now that you're thinking a bit about your organization and the work you're doing, and whether you'd like to share a project with us, and ultimately those across Canada, we want to let you know who is eligible to participate. So we've provided a bit of information here on the screen on the basics of participation. There's some exclusionary criteria that applies. For instance, if you worked in an organization that was a sponsor, such as Children's Healthcare Canada, but in our experience, the exclusionary criteria generally isn't applying to teams. For, for most um, part, if you're providing publicly funded healthcare um, in the country, you're eligible for the program. So once you register your team, it's up to you how much or how little you participate. You choose an indicator uh, and options include things like service helps uh, people stay at home, wait time, navigation of services, caregiver of distress, and more. So during the challenge, you share those two data points with us. And again, that's trying to get at is uh, your innovation effective and improving access? And we know that data is one of the metrics that we use to identify that. So there are awards throughout the program that uh, we do have one coming up next month as well. So stay tuned for Sabrina to walk through that. So many programs and quality improvements projects are eligible. It can be project-based. It can be a permanent program that you've put in place. And we know that small changes in the work that we're doing can make a big difference in outcomes. So we currently have 18 teams enrolled in Priority Health. Eight of those teams are focusing on improving care for children and or youth. And one of our pediatric teams is led by Carly Brown and her work with complex, complex respiratory patients at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, often referred to uh, CHEO here in Ontario. So I'm going to pause um, and uh, hand it over to Carly, who's going to share with us the work that she is doing to improve access to care uh, for patients accessing CHEO services. And then once Carly's done, we'll, we'll also pause for any questions you have. So feel free as she's presenting and sharing with you um, to use that chat box and ask any questions or make any comments along the way. So Carly, I'm thrilled that you were able to join us and happy to hand it off to you. Thanks so much, Lindsay, and for uh, CFHI's investment in home and community care. Uh, none of this work would be possible without the Priority Health Innovation Challenge, and I look forward to continuing my work on this incredible initiative. So our primary indicator for the challenge is to help pediatric patients stay home. And home mechanical ventilation is one of the most specialized therapies offered to community dwelling individuals. And CHEO's home ventilation program currently cares for 440 technologically dependent children. So these are children who have tracheostomies, are ventilator dependent on non-invasive ventilation for life support, continuous positive airway pressure, those that need airway clearance devices, and our more complex respiratory patients requiring oxygen. So just to give you an idea, in 2016, I managed 113 technologically dependent children. And fast forward to today, we now have 440 children in our program. And we do suspect that this number will continue to rise as we're caring for more complex patients out of hospital and in the community. We do do a relatively good job at getting these children discharged from hospital, but once they're out in the community, there's very little integration for this patient population. 
Support services for families tend to be based on geographical location versus medical need. So some families seem to receive a lot of nursing and PSW hours, whereas others may receive none. And many of the community care providers have no pediatric or respiratory experience. And this results in a high turnover of personnel and lots of caregiver stress. And due to multiple service providers in each region, it's also difficult for agencies to maintain a cohort of well-trained staff that can readily provide care in the community on an ongoing basis. And unfortunately, CHEO does not have the resources in place to offer ongoing training to community care agencies and caregivers. So basically, once out of hospital, for lack of a better word, these families are ultimately on their own. And the therapy is so advanced and specialized that ventilator-assisted individuals are frequent high-end users of the healthcare system. These um, result in frequent emergency room visits, long hospital stays, and furthermore, CHEO has had consistent problems discharging these complex patients from hospital to home, and they require higher resources than can be provided on a hospital ward. So these children often have long ICU bed days. As we know, wait times to see outpatient specialists are also getting longer and longer, and due to equipment requirements, it can be quite difficult for families to attend their clinic appointments. So I just want to show you an example of how much equipment one tracheostomy and mechanically ventilated child requires whenever they leave their home. They need uh, two to three providers to attend each appointment just to bring the necessary equipment. And I'm just wondering if you guys have the slide with, uh, with the patient, just so I can show you that equipment. Yeah, there she is. So you can see there on her cart, she has her ventilator, she has her humidifier, she also has her suction machine. And in that travel bag, she has her emergency tracheostomy kit, her feeding supplies, her suctioning supplies. And if we go to the next slide, You'll be able to see she has her travel oxygen that she needs to bring with her, as well as on the back of her ventilator, uh, back of her wheelchair, she has her secondary machine uh, set up as well because she's 24/7 ventilator dependent. So if one machine fails, she needs to have her backup. And on the next slide, you can see that this is a typical outing and she has her cough assist there to the right of her with all of her travel equipment and that's an example um, of her home setup and just how much equipment is required uh, for this patient. So I, I'd also like to share mom's comments when she sent over these pictures and mom said over the past four years, we've managed to find the best way for us to wrangle all the equipment and supplies as compact and discreetly as we can. So I don't know if manageable is what you're going for, LOL. That said, we're always completely overwhelmed with how much we have to pack and account for every time we leave our room, never mind leaving our home or the town for appointments. I don't think I have an up-to-date photo of what compromises of a CHEO visit because it's literally ridiculous. But bear in mind that if we travel to CHEO, we have to bring backup machines and supplies for absolutely everything. Therefore, two ventilators, extra batteries for all equipment, tubing, etc. On the off chance that anything breaks, we need to have a backup of absolutely every single thing possible. I know you're well aware of this since you trained us. We've got saddlebags on her wheelchair to carry any supplies and emergency supplies for day outings. And her rolling wheel cart, the sloth one, comes with us everywhere since the cough assist is necessary to go with us everywhere. So there's literally no opportunity for us to go anyway without a second person. If her vent, humidifier, and suction are not mounted to her wheelchair, it needs to be in the colored IKEA carts as our home does not have room for all the equipment needed at once. I just know sometimes we tend to make things look easy. So I'm told, LOL, as easy as it looks, it's not. And this speaks volumes because this is actually one of our most organized families. And as you can see, there's just so much equipment um, and personnel required for one outing out of the home. And lastly, because there's so much equipment, oftentimes the wrong equipment arrives from vendors or families receive unnecessary equipment and it creates a lot of confusion and air in the home. So in 2017, the Champlain Lynn made its first investment into a complex respiratory care program, which aims to improve transitions from hospital to home for technologically dependent adults. 
It's shown great success in managing these complex patients from home out of hospital, but it currently does not support pediatric patients less than 18 years of age. So my goal via the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvements Innovation Challenge is to create a partnership between CHEO and Somerset's complex respiratory program to offer the same community services for our pediatric patients. The awarded monies have gone towards hiring a pediatric community respiratory therapist specialist. And services uh, provided with those funds includes unlimited training and education for care providers and home care agencies. And this includes flexible locations for training. So it could either be at the child's home, at their school, or even at the agency. As a result, there be decreased wait times for home care services, less wait time for staff trained, and decreased length of stay for patients requiring a cohort of trained staff to be safely discharged home. We're using a caregiver competency checklist as one of our measures. So this is a before and after training checklist to identify the number of providers trained and to ensure the effectiveness of the education being provided. The pediatric specialist is also able to offer home visits to titrate therapy and troubleshoot home equipment as needed. This in turn decreases wait time for care, results in less emergency room visits, decreases clinic wait times and prevents hospital readmissions. These are all secondary measures that we're tracking for this challenge. Caregivers are also given a questionnaire to assess if they had ongoing access to a respiratory therapist specialist by either phone or home visit, would it decrease their stress level? And although we're still early in our measures, they've all indicated very much so. The pediatric respiratory therapist specialist also improves patient and family experience by transitioning our pediatric patients to the adult model of care. So what this looks like is the specialist accompanies the child to their first clinic visit at the adult rehab center and continues to see that child through adulthood. And in past, this transition to a new model of care was particularly stressful for our patients and their families, uh, but it has greatly improved with this new role. It standardizes the transition process, so it decreases the wait time to transition to the adult model of care, it decreases patient and family stress, and it ensures a continuity of care through adulthood. The pediatric specialist also assists patients with death and dying at home and increases quality of life at home and out of hospital. So now I'd like to share a video with you of the work that's being done through Somerset West's complex respiratory program. And this is one of our adult patients um, being cared for by my amazing colleague, Emily McMullen. It's designed to reach those people living in the community who need extra support from a respiratory therapist. So these can be chronically uh, ventilated patients, either invasively ventilated or non-invasively ventilated people who are at home or in the community with trachs. Um, so we can do routine trach changes. Um, so I think it's really kind of, we brought the patient care back to the patient and it's really centered around him and just supporting him as a patient and supporting the caregivers really well. I think it's important that we also support the nursing agency staff. This is often sort of a new skill that's brought into the different communities and they need proper training. They need to feel comfortable and they need to know that there is support behind them. We see lots of chronically ventilated patients, lots of chronic trach patients, um, and there certainly is a backlog within the hospital system. Um, ideally, if they're able to be discharged home, this is perfect. So if they're able to return to their community, be with their family members, um, and they don't have to be in a acute care facility or a complex continuing care. So I'd like to share uh, with you two of our most significant results to date. Um, so the first is a two-year-old tracheostomy ventilated patient who had 19 admissions over the last year. And these admissions ranged anywhere from six days to three weeks stays with an average readmission rate of every two weeks. So this child does have the most loving and capable parents, but yet still required frequent hospitalization due to respiratory infections, inadequate secretion management, and respiratory exacerbations. 
And from CFHI's funding, the pediatric respiratory therapist specialist was able to attend pre-discharge meetings, develop a chest health action plan, obtain specialty equipment prior to discharge home, train all of his home care staff on the respiratory equipment and what steps should be taken should the patient show signs of increased work of breathing to manage more comfortably and safely at home. The PEDS specialist has been able to act as a resource for the family and can provide ongoing follow-up and home visits as needed. So the outcome to this is prior to the specialist position, the child had 96 ICU bed days and 57 more days, totaling 153 bed days, which cost approximately half a million dollars in hospital bed days. After implementing the rule, the child only had one admission after nine and a half weeks post-discharge versus his standard two weeks post-discharge and a shortened stay. And likewise, the same services were offered to another two-year-old tracheostomy ventilated, ventilated child who was not expected to ever leave hospital. The pediatric RT specialist was able to offer the same services and the child was successfully discharged December 4th with no emergency room visits or readmissions post-discharge home. So the outcomes for this child who had had 115 ICU bed days and 131 ward days, which is 246 days in total, had an approximately $680,000 cost savings and um, has had no readmissions, no bed days and has remained stable at home. So in both scenarios, the pediatric respiratory therapist community specialist was able to ensure consistency of care using best practices to ensure that children are discharged as expeditiously and safely as possible and to maintain health post discharge via ongoing follow up. The rules already shown to decrease complication rates, decrease hospital length of stay, and improve efficiencies by preventing emergency room visits and readmissions. And more importantly, the rule continues to improve patient experience, standardizes provider education, and keeps patients safe and healthy at home. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. And I think a great demonstration of the importance of care closer to home and really increasing that access, especially, as you said, for those um, younger kids who are not served through the, the current system. So thank you again for sharing. Uh, and your participation in the Priority Health Innovation Challenge. We're glad that you've been able to use your winnings. Um, mm -hmm. And Sabrina will talk a bit more about that for the larger group as well, that um, any awards that you win through the Priority Health Innovation Challenge, you can choose to spend them as you'd like. So if that's staffing, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. So we're great to see it being put to good use. Um, and I'm just going to check in with Paula before uh, before we hand it off to Sabrina. Paula, anything in the chat box? No, not yet, but I do. It gives me an opportunity to encourage our attendees to post their questions as they come to them in the chat box, and we'll answer them as we go. Great. Thanks, Paula. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Sabrina to take a deeper dive into what is Priority Health Innovation Challenge um, and how you can participate to improve access to care across Canada. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and thank you so much, Carly, for sharing that amazing uh, example and for giving us a real um, example of what, um, what kind of teams are in the Priority Health Innovation Challenge. So as Lindsay mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the Priority Health Innovation Challenge is an open outcomes-based challenge that runs until October 2020. The challenge is designed to identify and grow promising innovations that will improve access to care. The federal, provincial, and territorial governments have made 12 common indicators their shared priorities. We're looking for healthcare teams that have a novel approach to improving access to mental health and addiction services or home and community care, two of those shared health priorities. Teams will, will track progress on one or more of the 12 indicators in the shared health priorities, which I'm going to share shortly. And um, the participants in the challenge will be able to highlight their work and share their innovative programs with peers across the country, learn from others, gain national recognition, and be eligible for financial awards. So we have a coalition of 19 leading healthcare organizations who are supporting the challenge, including the Canadian Home Care Association, Mental Health Commission of Canada, and the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction, as well as Children's Healthcare Canada. The organizations support us through judging, curriculum development, and overall support of the challenges. 
And so these are the um, the 12 access to care indicators that I mentioned. Um, but before I go into them, I want to um, just point you towards the chat box and to let us know, are you working on programs that relate to any of these following indicators? Or do these indicators reflect any of the goals of your project or program? So please type in the chat box. Um, and uh, I'm going to check back in with Paul after a few slides to see what we have in there. So really, uh, we want to hear what you're working on right now. So as mentioned, this challenge is primarily an outcomes-based challenge. This means that we have 12 indicators that we are focusing on, six in mental health and addictions, as you can see on the slide, and six in home and community care. To register your project, program, or initiative, you will need to share data on your progress towards improvement in one of these indicators or more, if you'd like, on a monthly basis, and also to share with us how many patients you've reached. If you're in the early stages of your work and don't have data yet, that's not a problem. You can still register, and once you have data, simply start sharing then. We're looking for teams doing innovative work with early results that may lead to future spread and scale, and ultimately improve access in mental health and addiction services or home and community care. And so to better illustrate what projects or initiatives may fit in each category, uh, we're getting some background noise. Perfect, okay. So to be better illustrate what projects or initiatives may fit in each category, we have highlighted examples of how teams might address the improvement indicators using real priority health innovation teams. So for to, the overarching goal for home and community care is to improve access, and this is, can be achieved by spreading and scaling evidence-based models of home and community care that are more integrated and connected with primary health care. So an example of a real priority health team is the Lanark Renfrew Lung Health Program. And this project um, or program that works on the integration of the health, lung health program, community-based pulmonary rehab program, and primary care outreach for seniors programs to improve early screening of COPD. And this is done by the Lanark Renfrew Health and Community Services in Lanark, Ontario. So the next one, enhancing access to palliative and end of life care at home or in hospices. We have the integrating palliative support as routine care for patients with stage four lung cancer. So this program integrates early re referral to palliative support as part of routine care for all patients with stage four lung cancer treated at the MUHC. And this is being done by the McGill University Health Center in Montreal, Quebec. The third thing, uh, the third indicator we see here on the screen is increasing support for caregivers. And so one team is looking, uh, is working on the Care for the Caregiver program, which is a three-tiered program offering varying levels of support for caregivers. And this is being done by the CBI Home Health Group in Etobicoke, Ontario. And lastly, um, we see enhancing home care infrastructure such as digital connectivity, remote monitoring, technology, and facilities for community-based service delivery. And so we have the Enhanced Home Living Supports Pilot Program, which is supporting caregivers and keeping home care clients at home. And this is being done by the Alberta Health Services Edmonton Zone, so Edmonton Zone Home Living in Edmonton, Alberta. Okay, and now so we're gonna do look at the ones for mental health and addiction. So um, improving access for, to mental health and addiction services, this can be achieved by expanding access to community-based mental health and addiction services for children and youth aged 10 to 25, recognizing the effectiveness of early interventions to treat mild to moderate mental health disorders. And so we have the Improving Access to Bounce Back program, which is designed to improve access to services that help youth and adults build skills to manage low mood, depression, anxiety, stress, or worry. And this is being done by the Canadian Mental Health Association in the York Region, Ontario. We also have a few teams uh, working on internet cognitive behavioral therapy. We have the spreading evidence-based models of community mental health care and culturally appropriate interventions that are integrated with primary health services. And so we have a team working on introducing electronic medical records to preventative and primary care resources. So this team is comparing the populations of Albertans who identify personal challenges with mental health and addictions to util utilization of services as reported by Stats Canada. And this is being done by the Indigo Harm Reduction Team in Edmonton, Alberta. And lastly, on the screen, 
we see expanding availability of integrated community-based mental health and addiction services for people with complex health needs. And so we have a team looking to mobilize technology to reduce harm. So they use on-demand self-service technology to combat addictions in high-risk, marginalized populations. This is being done by the AIDS Network, Kootenai Outreach and Support Society in Nelson, BC. So as you can see, we have a lot of teams doing a lot of innovative work in all of the different sectors. And you've heard from Carly doing some innovative work at CHEO. Um, so really, there's tons of opportunity here. If you're doing something new or novel, um, we'd like to hear about it. So I'm going to pause here and go back to Paula to see that if we heard anything in the chat box. And just a reminder, we asked, are you working on programs that relate to any of these indicators? Or do these indicators reflect any of the goals of your project or program? So Paula, are we seeing anything in the chat box? So nothing in the chat box at, uh, at this point in time. Um, but I'll let you know as more comes. Perfect. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the challenge. Oh, we're seeing some uh, background noise. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so participating in the challenge allows you to interact with like-minded teams across Canada. It gives you a chance to share and increase the impact of the work that you are doing on improving access to care for those receiving mental health and addiction services or home and community care. So you, teams join webinars and participate in our award challenges. And we have up to $400,000 in awards available throughout the challenge. So we want you to keep doing the great work that you're doing. So if you're successful in receiving um, an award, you can use the money as you choose. So this is what Lindsay was mentioning. You can use it to buy resources. Um, as Carly mentioned, you can use it uh, to increase staffing for your projects. So really, we want you to be able to use the money as you'd like to spread and scale your work. And so this diagram oh. is just to show the journey of a team throughout the Priority Health Innovation Challenge. The teams who are already doing the work or planning to initiate the work to improve access to mental health or addiction services or home and community care can register on the portal. So that's an online um, website where we have all the information for you and all the award submissions. So you're and so after that, teams are invited to attend webinars, which are held every two to three months to learn, share information, and get access to rewards. Teams submit monthly patient reach data and share quarterly data reports on your outcomes. And we work with teams to identify those with earlier promising results. And ultimately, you have a chance to win awards to continue to spread and scale your work. And so this week, we're excited to announce a new award opportunity that we've just added. So this is really hot off the press, and you're probably the first uh, group to hear about it, which we're really excited about. Um, so uh, as you can see, these are the key dates. Um, we have a key dates document that outlines the entire next step. Um, as I mentioned, we've added another mini, mini challenge that's not on this sheet yet, so it's really hot off the press. It's due March 16, 2020. And for this challenge, teams will develop a project charter to encompass the work that you're currently doing for a chance to win one of seven prizes of $5,000. So this is an award you won't see here yet, but um, once you register and you get the key dates documents, that will be added in. So um, also, as you can see up on here, we have a webinar for teams coming up on March 17th, 2020. And um, after the next mini challenge, our next major award is the Impact Challenge Award, which you can see here um, due September 30th, in which teams submit a report to demonstrate your progress of improvement against their indicator. And really, we want to hear the story and context of the work that you're doing. So this, is a, this next award is an opportunity to do that. I'm going to pause here um, and um, checking in with Paula again. Do we have any questions? I know it's a lot of information, um, but really it's, we have some key documents for you that that make it very simple. And Lindsay and I are available at any time to connect with you if you have any further questions or to help you through the process. So we do have a couple of questions. One is, what project is addressing the increased support for caregivers? Um, okay, let me just go back there. So this is the um, one of the projects that we have on here is the Care for the Caregiver program. So this is a three-tiered program offering varying levels of support for caregivers. Um, and this is being done by the CBI Home Health Group. 
in Ontario. And so if you go onto our website, the CFHI website, um, the Priority Health, and you type in Priority Health Innovation Challenge, we also have um, descriptions of our, of our current teams there. And so there you'll be able to see what teams are working on. It gives their description, what kind of indicators they're working on. So that's a great opportunity to see what's happening right now. So that'll have all most of the examples that I've mentioned laid out there as well. And maybe just to add to that as well, hi, it's Lindsay. Um, we do find, so teams, when they join, they select a primary indicator. And you saw Carly shared her primary indicator. She also shared that there's a number of other things that she's working on, improving the caregiver experience, for instance, that are really important for her project. So in this case, caregiver distress is in fact part of her project. She is trying to reduce that um, caregiver uh, distress related to care. So, and, and that's why she's asking those questions around experience and engaging families in terms of how to better design the program to meet their needs. So we also see that teams, although they may pick one primary indicator because um, you are limited with just one primary indicator based on the rules of the challenge, we do encourage you to pick secondary indicators. So we know that um, many of the projects are aimed at reducing uh, family caregiver distress. So we have a, a team out of Sunnybrook Hospital, for instance, that is working on uh, service navigation for youth in the mental health system. But a big part of their project is also supporting families where potentially the youth isn't willing to engage in service or the family may need more assistance um, with coaching, support, et cetera. So um, in that case, they're also looking at caregiver distress. So it really is how you how you frame your work and picking that primary indicator you think this is this is what I'm most interested or what I think I'm going to most be able to impact but we recognize that improvement work is likely going to impact multiple other areas and indicators in this case so as Sabrina said absolutely those descriptions are, are on the website as well but give some thought to um, you know all of those improvement ideas and how those impact the family or caregiver experience as well. One Thank other comment. Um, it's a, not a question, but an overall comment. Uh, this participant is coming from Nova Scotia and she says, my mind is blown and I'm thrilled to learn this program exists. She has many projects that they're working on that fit the criteria to a T. So you've um, got a very excited individual there. Perfect. That's amazing We're to hear. <laughs> We're very excited. And just to let you know, um, the, the rules do allow, we know that your organization isn't just working on one improvement project. So the rules of the, the challenge, we call them the official terms and conditions, but they, they ultimately are the rules. The rules allow you to enter multiple projects. You just need to have a different team lead for each project. And of course, you're using different data. Um, so know that uh, if you have multiple projects, you can also um, share multiple different ideas with us. So happy to see teams participate. And as Sabrina said, we have a March award coming up. So not far off and a great opportunity. $5,000 can, can go a long way in building some momentum for your work. So. Great. Well, we hope there's, there's, thank you for sharing in the chat box that there's some enthusiasm for the program and, and we hope that exists in other cases as well. And it, again, if it's not you, consider if you um, have a colleague or, or another agency in your network that may benefit from hearing about this. We know funding is a challenge in the sector. So certainly we know we can't replicate um, core funding, but by being able to provide some financial awards, we're really hoping it accelerates your work. Um, our most recent award opportunity that just passed in January, the first place award was $20,000. So there are substantial sums of money here that can uh, really move your work along. So in terms of next steps, you can register your team. Uh, as Sabrina said, we do use a portal. Uh, it's basically um, similar to SurveyMonkey. So you, you create a registration via the portal and you share your work. Really straightforward, but Sabrina and I are both here um, and assigned to this project to assist you with that registration process. So what we often encourage teams to do is 
reach out to us when you're ready to register. The challenges email that you see on the screen goes to both of us. Um, and then we're happy to walk you through that process. And again, provide some coaching and support to make sure that the indicators that you're picking are the right indicators and those data points really do tell the story of your improvement. We want to support you as being in, as successful as possible in the challenge. Um, and by making sure you're kind of sharing with us the right metrics, we're not trying to increase your workload, but to look at the metrics you are collecting to make sure what you pick as that indicator really does give you the best chance for success. Uh, we also have that webinar series even if you choose not to join the challenges, you're welcome to join us on the webinar series. Always happy to, to have folks participate. Our next webinar is March 17th, and we will be talking about uh, quality improvement and improving data and reporting. So a great time if you're coming on board to join that webinar. We also share those on the website in the event. Uh, I know everyone's schedules are busy uh, and we air the webinars at 12 o'clock Eastern. But certainly if you're not able to join us and if you want to look at the webinars that we've posted in the past, please log in uh, or sorry, just join our <laughs> website at CFHI and you'll see under Priority Health Challenge all those previous webinars. If there's any materials you see in there that you think you'd be interested in accessing, again, reach out to us. Sabrina and I uh, are very lucky to be supported by those 19 partner organizations, so have access to a wealth of knowledge and expertise uh, to connect you if we're not able to support. And ultimately, what we want to do and support you in doing is improving care. And we do that in lots of different ways. Um, but we hope that by sharing your progress, by building that profile of your work um, and supporting you through those financial awards, that you continue to accelerate and do that wonderful work that you're doing to bring care closer to home and community and really improve that access uh, for everyone that, uh, that we serve. Paula, anything else in the chat box to respond to? There's one more comment about um, asking if you could share the information again about the March 16th Project Charter Initiative. Great, absolutely happy to. And, and Paula, it's a good question. If, if you send out information after the webinar, we're happy to include that as well um, for any participants. Paula, is that an option? I'll uh, have it linked to the notice that all registrants get um, following the webinar. Fantastic. So we'll share that with everyone. Um, but those award opportunities uh, that happen along the way, as Sabrina mentioned, it's up to you whether you choose to join. What we've done in this uh, challenge, it's due March 16th, is we have a project charter, so an improvement charter. Uh, we have a template developed, and we'll ask you to complete that based on the current state of your project. So you may be preparing for implementation, you may be in action stage, you may be sustaining two years down the road. Totally fine of where you're at in that project. We just ask that your charter that you submit reflect the current status of your project. So, so not necessarily beginning stages if you're, if you're no longer beginning. We then, um, you submit that charter that you've completed using the, the template from CFHI. You submit it through the portal and it's then judged by our panel of judges, which are those supporting organizations. And the top seven winners out of those submissions, um, based on, on the scoring, uh, are awarded $5,000. What we try and do in advance is make sure that you're aware of what that scoring is based on. So that's what we'll provide Paul of the information on and we'll, we'll share the template as well. Um, and that, that scoring criteria is what we kind of follow letter. <laughs> we, we follow it quite closely to the letter, certainly when we're looking at judging. And it depends how many teams submit a project charter in terms of uh, what your opportunities are to win, your odds of winning basically. But right now we know we have 18 teams registered uh, and only registered teams are able to participate in the challenge. So a great opportunity to join us 
and participate in that award. And again, if there's any kind of coaching or support you need along the way, uh, Sabrina and I are happy to provide that as well. We're, we're here to support you in your participation. And there are no yeah, and I'm just, sorry. I just like to add that that challenge is now open until March 16th. So once you register on the portal, if you're interested in registering for the for the Party Health Innovation Challenge, you will see that as the next opportunity. So you can start working on it as soon as as soon as you register. And is there support for? Uh, sorry, it's Paula with another question. Is there support? for the preparation of that um, project charter and application? Yeah, so uh, this program is a light touch program. So we, we don't have the capacity to provide intensive uh, quality improvement supports to teams who are joining. Uh, we do deliver our curriculum through the webinars, but we're always available to book a coaching call with to offer support, uh, provide some direction on the completion of that charter, have the access to some great tools that we're happy to share. So although we may not be able to walk you through every aspect of that, we're certainly happy to book a call, offer some support, and provide some feedback about opportunities to refine that charter if you would like. Wonderful. Thank you. If there are any other questions, please type them in the box. If not, we can um, begin to, to wrap up, unless, of course, you have other comments to add, um, Lindsay, Carly, or Sabrina. No, I, I think that was it for us. We're certainly um, very pleased to be here today and, and have this chance to, to speak with you. And um, great to, to hear have Carly join us as well. I mean, you know she's very, very busy clinically, so such a pleasure to have her on the line today. But really thankful that everyone was able to share their time with us today. And we hope we'll hear from at least some of you uh, to join the Priority Health Innovation Challenge and, and access those uh, opportunities. And I would just like to say a special thanks to Lindsay and Sabrina for all your help and support. Um, I know initially when I was getting started, I placed a call to a friend. So <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay, Sabrina, and Carly. Children's Healthcare Canada hosts Spark Live webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. And that's Eastern time. It's always great if you watch live as your questions and comments really enrich the discussion. But if you can't watch live, the recordings of these sessions are made available after the fact on our Knowledge Exchange Network. We're very excited about the next upcoming webinar on February 19th when we'll hear from Dr. Tim Oberlander and Alexandra Neville from BC Children's Hospital about the diagnostic uncertainty in youth with chronic pain and their parents. This webinar is another being provided in partnership with Solutions for Kids in Pain, or SKIP. And as many of you will already know, SKIP is a knowledge mobilization network, one of Canada's networks of centers of excellence, working to bridge the gap between existing evidence-based solutions and patient care. SKIP's co-led by Dr. Christine Chambers at Dalhousie and Doug Maynard here at Children's Healthcare Canada. If you have not already signed up, please do so for our children's Healthcare Canada Spark newsletter to stay up to date on all of our activities and events. So thanks again for joining us today and thanks to the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement or CFHI for supporting our webinar program. And hopefully we'll see many of you back here for the February 19th webinar. Bye everyone. Bye.